Good morning, San Antonio people. My name is Father Chris Heath. I am the archivist of the Diocese of Orange, and because I feel sorry for your pastor, I told him I would take Mass this morning, Monday morning, and Friday morning next week. So here we are, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. A reading from the book of the prophet Hosea. Thus says the Lord, Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God. You have collapsed through your guilt. Take with you words and return to the Lord. Say to him, Forgive all iniquity and receive what is good, that we may, that we may render an offering the bullocks from our stalls, Assyria will not save us, nor shall we have horses to mount. We shall say no more, our God, to the work of our hands. For in you the orphan finds compassion. I will heal their defection, says the Lord. I will love them freely, for my wrath is turned away from them. I will be like the dew for Israel. He shall blossom like the lily. He shall strike root like the Lebanon cedar and put forth his shoots. His splendor shall be like the olive tree and his fragrance like the Lebanon cedar. Again, they shall dwell in his shade and raise grain. They shall blossom like the vine, and his fame shall be like the wine of Lebanon. Ephraim, what more has he to do with idols? I have humbled him, but I will prosper him. I am like a verdant cypress tree, because of me, you bear fruit. Let him who is wise understand these things. Let him who is prudent know them. Straight are the paths of the Lord. In them the just walk, but sinners stumble in them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to his apostles, Behold, I'm sending you like sheep in the midst of wolves. So be shrewd as serpents and simple as dove. But be bear, beware of men, for they will hand you over to courts and scourge you in their synagogues. And you will be led before governors and kings for my sake as a witness before them and the pagans. When they hand you over, do not worry about what you are to speak or what you are to say. You will be given at that moment what you are to say. For it will not be you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will hand brother to death and father his child. Children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but whoever endures to the end will be saved. And when they persecute you in one town, flee to another. Amen. I say to you, you will not finish the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The Gospel of the Lord. Today we read the end of the prophet Hosea. These are the last verses of his book. And we've been reading from Hosea all week. And I don't know if anybody told you this, but Hosea was a pretty, uh, pretty tough prophet. Um, his whole life was a living parable of the relationship between God and Israel. So Hosea is a prophet. His full-time job is a paid professional prophet in the temple. And people would come to him, give him money, and ask for a message from God. We don't have that kind of job title anymore, but 
this idea that he was a very public figure is part of the storyline, which is God asked Hosea to marry a woman who was psychologically incapable of being faithful. She was a prostitute. Imagine the prophet marrying a prostitute and what kind of life they had together was just awful. And because it was public, everybody saw it. Everybody was scandalized. Nobody knew what to do with Hosea. And Hosea kept saying, what's going on with me is the way God feels about you. So he marries Gomer, a great name for a lady, and they have three kids, and every one of their kids are, just, are given the most horrible names. One's named, I have no pity for you, whatever that is in, in Hebrew, but in English, it's, I have no pity for you. Another kid's name is, you are not my people. <laughs> it's like, okay, these are, these are great names. The third one was, I'm going to do to you what I did to Jezreel. It's just awful stuff. And over the course of 20 years of a public life, what his lifestyle was showing people was here's, you know, Gomer would come and would live with him for a while and then she'd disappear and you knew what she was doing and then she'd come crawling back and, and, and Hosea would take her back again and then she'd disappear again. And this happened over and over again. And the people were just beside themselves for Hosea's sake. And the, 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 his writings and his public speaking was basically, I am like God and Gomer is like Israel. And your infidelity hurts me. Because everybody could see what, how, how Gomer's infidelity to Hosea was, was just killing him. So the prophet Hosea was all about fidelity, begging the people to come back to God and to stay with him instead of worshiping false gods. And understand, when we talk about false gods, we're not talking about like mythology. We're talking about demons. If you're not worshiping the one true God, you are worshiping a fallen angel. And some of them were pretty awful, like demanding human sacrifice kind of stuff. So the infidelity that God felt when his people, the people he redeemed, the people he rescued from Egypt and brought them into the promised land are now not being faithful to their God, as far as God is concerned, is infidelity. And any married couple if, God forbid, any of you have any idea what infidelity is like, you can imagine now, put it in the big picture. Here's God and how he feels about his people who are worshiping all these other gods out there. God is insulted and, and heartbroken over his people not paying attention to him, not being faithful to him. Hosea's whole life was an expression of that, begging the people to come back to the one true God ended up not happening. And so the people of Israel in 721 were wiped off the map by the Assyrian nation. They had a chance to repent and return. They didn't take it, and so they lost everything. In the gospel, we have the story of Jesus. It's, it's a pretty dire message as well, you know, as he sends his apostles out in groups of six, two by two, out into the towns and villages. He warns them to expect pushback, that they're not going to be accepted. But what Matthew does with this is he doesn't, he's not just saying what the apostles will experience in their couple of week journey out. Matthew sort of takes a step back and says to the entire church, you're going to all expect this. This isn't just going to happen to the 12 apostles in a couple of weeks of missionary work. Missionary work in general will always cause disciples to be persecuted. Maybe you have felt that, Certainly, over the course of 2,000 years, the church has had plenty of pushback. Our message is not acceptable. Just recently with the, like, the Supreme Court decision, the Catholic Church is not acceptable to people because we had something to do with that law being changed. Well, good, I'm glad we did because that's exactly where we should be in matters of life, in matters of justice, and yet the pushback can be pretty tough, even downright dangerous. In every generation, there's going to be some kind of persecution of the church, persecution of Christians. You may have experienced it with adult children or other family members who you know they know the faith because you gave it to them themselves and they've wandered off. What Jesus says in this gospel didn't just apply to his 12 apostles, it applies to everybody. That we can expect that if we are being faithful, there will be pushback. 
That's one of the reasons why it's easy not to be faithful, because nobody wants to be the bad guy. Nobody wants to be persecuted. Hosea put himself in that position of living a, a horrible lifestyle because of the person that he married, but it was all for the purpose of teaching us right behavior. And if we are going to be people who are in any way trying to give glory to God or trying to preach the truth or trying to live that truth as Catholic Christians, we can expect pushback too. Hopefully not to the degree of absolute martyrdom, but in lots of big and little ways, we can expect our Christianity not to be acceptable, even in our own homes, certainly not in our politics. But here we are. You show up for daily mass because your love for God makes you come here. You're not here out of obligation. You're here out of love. And God loves you for that. He loves your fidelity. And he hopes that fidelity is something that isn't just seen here in church by receiving communion, but out there in your families, in your communities, in your public civic circles out there that somehow this good news is getting out into the towns and villages, into the communities that you go to that I won't go to. And maybe that message will be acceptable, maybe it won't. But either way, our fidelity will be a blessing to God and ultimately a blessing for us.